My name is Corey Evans, and I'm the chair of the Small Business Committee of Community Board 8. I'm also your host for tonight's episode of Community Board 8 Speaks. With me is my guest, Andrew Kalik. Andrew, tell us a little about yourself. Well, thank you very much, Corey. Thank you for having me on the show. We're happy to be here. I'm the Deputy General Counsel for Manhattan Borough President Scott Stringer, and in addition to my lawyerly duties, I'm also a policy analyst and an advisor on issues related to economic development and small business. So I'm excited to be here to talk to you today, not only about what challenges small business face in Manhattan and throughout the five boroughs, but also what the future of small business is in New York City. It's just such a critical part of our city's economy, and going forward, we need to do all that we can to make sure it remains that way. That's right. When we think about the New York City economy, what immediately comes to mind are big skyscrapers, Wall Street, big businesses, but it's not all like that, right? No, it certainly is not. And we, we need Wall Street as part of our economy, and Fortune 500 companies do headquarter here almost more than anywhere else in the world, and that's something to be proud of. Um, but that's only one part of New York City's economy. You understand, that, like everybody does, that New York's history has really been an immigrant history. People coming here from all 50 states, from all corners of the globe, opening up their shop on a street corner and making a community thrive as a result. And you know, there have been some bumps in the road recently for small businesses. And what we need to make sure that that story, that story that has always defined New York's economy, continues into the 21st century. And we think there are real specific ways to go about doing that. When we think of small businesses, of course, corner stores, that too, but there's also a lot of small business development in the high tech sector, right? There is. And we published a report, Startup City, in December of 2012 that looked at the entrepreneurial economy of New York, looked at this burgeoning digital field, and kind of asked the question, what can we do to not only maintain and expand it throughout the city, but what are the obstacles to that expansion? And how do we attack that? Because you're right, it's not just about the bodega or the laundromat. It's about a tech company that starts small and grows into something big. We've seen, just in recent months, New York City's tech industry, things that started small here, like Tumblr, sell for a billion dollars. And that's not going to be typical. But it's that type of growth story that we're looking to achieve. And not just in the tech world, and not just in the corner store world, but in a variety of industries. We've seen boosts in artisanal manufacturing, small manufacturing on the Sunset Park waterfront. We've seen continued increase in the way architecture firms and other service-oriented industries are exporting their goods and services overseas. So we're seeing small business diversify, and it, it, is, it is as diverse today as the city is itself. What, what exactly is artisanal manufacturing? That's, that's, that's what sounds interesting. Yeah, you know, you think about manufacturing and you think about big factories on the waterfront, you know, maybe the Domino sugar plant back in the day. And of course, those manufacturing jobs in many parts of our city have disappeared. Um, there are still some, but they have been decreasing. But what we have seen rise in their place, um, and more and more over the last decade, are small manufacturers, particularly in boroughs outside of Manhattan, mm -hmm. making products both for the domestic and international market that build off New York City's brand. I mean, it's amazing, you know, you hear about B Brooklyn Brewery, and you think about folks in bars throughout the five boroughs looking to sit back and relax with a, 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 you know, a bottle of a Brooklyn brew. But it's not just folks in the five boroughs. It's people outside the city who are attracted to our brand. And we need to help small businesses take advantage of that, that brand that we've built both domestically and internationally. That's wonderful. Now, small businesses, you know, they employ a great portion of the workforce. So what portion would you say, roughly, um, as a percentage of the workforce? Is it, is it a big part? Is it, is it mostly, is most of the employment coming from big businesses, or is it from growing small firms, too? Well, the, the vast majority of firms, of businesses in New York City, are small. And you would expect that. The, the big companies employ many people, but there are few of those companies. And so, for instance, in our Growing Gotham report, which is on minority and women business enterprises, we surveyed every single 
one of, man, of New York City's certified minority and women business enterprises. And there are over 3,500 certified firms in New York, but there are, this, and this is really amazing, Corey, 403,000 minority-owned businesses in wow. New York City. 403,000. That's wonderful. It's by far the most in the country. That's fantastic. And many of them are located in, as you might expect, communities of color. And so we need to do all that we can, not only for MWBEs, but for all small businesses to ensure that they can continue to grow and thrive and employ people in their neighborhoods. Because that's really what they are. They are neighborhood engines of growth. And that's what they can be going forward as well. MWBs being minority and women-owned businesses. That's correct. Okay. Now, Community Board 8, within the Community Board 8 area, we have Roosevelt Island. And Roosevelt Island is very fascinating because in Roosevelt Island right now, we have the Cornell Technion project. And this is a, this is a cooperative project between Cornell and Technion universities to open a new tech campus, an engineering campus. What effect, you know, in California, in Silicon Valley, this has had some effect on the start of the very big effect. What effect do you think this will have? Is, is the small business core, is the high tech small business community in quarter, is that, is that an engine of a lot of growth in the future? Do you think this will help? Well, we've seen information technology jobs grow by 60% in the last decade. So oh, there's no awesome. reason to think that continuing down that path won't be as fruitful in the future. And one of the things that we identified in our Startup City report on the entrepreneurial economy was that perhaps the biggest obstacle to continued growth in New York City tech was the lack of talent, the talent gap. Mm -hmm. People wanting coders, people wanting engineers, but not being able to find the talent here. The, the theory has always been you need a whole bunch of engineers, Google needs a whole bunch of engineers, they find them in Silicon Valley. We don't want that to be the case. We want them to find them here, right here in New York City, and not only to find them from the graduates of Cornell Technion and other campuses, but to have our students who are in our public schools grow up to be those engineers, those coders, because those jobs are the jobs that pay middle class wages that can support families. And Borough President Stringer was very proud to, uh, to be part of the Cornell Technion project. It's one of Mayor Bloomberg's greatest legacies. And I think that it's important that we don't just graduate those students who are going to be coming from all over the world to this great new campus on Roosevelt Island, but that when they graduate, they stay here. They build their businesses here. And that's why one of the recommendations in our Startup City report was the Empire Engineers Initiative, which is a financial aid program for engineering graduates in New York State. You graduate with an engineering degree, you have student debt, we know what a big problem student debt is. If you decide, if you commit to working for at least five years in New York State, New York State is gonna help you pay off your loans. That is the type of investment in our students and our future that's gonna pay dividends. And the, the good news is that Assemblymember Rosick from Queens and Senator Carlucci from uh, Westchester have introduced the Empire Initiative, the Empire Engineers Initiative Act in the state legislature. So we're hopeful this coming session to be able to push that and to really be able to kind of double down on the bet that Mayor Bloomberg has made on Cornell Tech. That session starting in January of 2014 That's right. and going through the, the end of the session in June of 2014. That's right. Great. So suppose that uh, I'm, you know, I'm here, I have a great idea, uh, I live in the city, and I want to start a business. What's the very first step that I go about? What's the, very first idea? What's the very first interaction I'll have with the city? Well, sometimes it's hard to know what to do, right. and that's part of the problem, right? right. And uh, it can be a daunting thing, especially for uh, a young person or for an immigrant who might not know, you know the appropriate channels to go to, there might be language barriers, to go about following their dream. And so to the credit of the Department of Small Business Services, they have launched a kind of business solutions website, which is designed to be a one-stop shop for permits and the type of licenses that you need to start whatever you want. It could be a tech company, it could be a bar, it could be a laundromat, it could be whatever you imagined. That would be the first point of contact for you with, with the city. And you know, people talk about red tape and it's there, and it's real, and people feel it. Part of our survey, Growing Gotham, of minority and women business enterprises, said that once people applied and were finally in the system, they understood just how kind of useful it was to 
get access to those tools and those services, but that it was very hard to get over that initial hurdle. And so what we need to do is make sure that small business owners, would-be entrepreneurs understand that the New York City Business Solutions Program is out there and available to them so that they can get the permits and licenses quickly um, and get into business as soon as possible. Right, because it can be very confusing if you're opening a business. What, what exact, even what permits or what licenses you even need. That's right. Right. And, and, not, and not only confusing, but costly. And, right. You know, people aren't coming, many people don't come to New York with huge amounts of venture capital. They can't wait 90 days even to right. get off the ground. They, they've got to pay rent to their landlord, not only their, their landlord for their housing, and we know how housing prices are in this city, but also to the landlord of their new business. So they can't wait, and we need to make sure that the Department of Buildings, the Department of Small Business Services, every agency in city government is responsible for the business of business, as we call it, really helping people get their ideas off the ground to make New York a stronger place. It's a good thing that you come to you come to rent, because so I'm opening my, I've got my great new startup idea. It's going to be a great company. My friends, it's all set up. And I come to opening my office, and I look at office rents, and I think, oh my gosh, you know, the office rent is, is so high, you know, how am I going to be able to afford this? When we've gone in the community, when, when the Small Business Committee has held panels, we hear that a lot from business owners. We hear, well, you know, the, the rent is just so high, I, have to, I felt like I have to leave the city. What, does, what can the city do, and what programs maybe does the city already have that, that folks might not know about to try to help offset or help businesses with that very high cost of office space and rent? That's a great question, Corinne. It's a great challenge for all of our small businesses uh, because just as housing prices are through the roof in so many parts of New York, so are prices for that first floor commercial place right. or even for office space. Right. And so what we recommended in Startup City, our report on the entrepreneurial economy, was that the city needs to do more to help businesses that are in the kind of middle school stage of development that we called it. The big guys, the folks, w the businesses that have a lot of employees, they're in the commercial office space. They're in the real estate in Midtown and Lower Manhattan in many situations. They can afford to rent a floor or at least half a floor. For the small guys, the entrepreneurs just starting out with one employee, two employees, five employees, we've seen incubators and shared workspaces popping up all over the city. And these are mainly privately run and they're designed to allow a small young business that doesn't have a huge amount of capital for, for rent to rent as little as one chair at a shared desk. <laughs> you and me could be in business <laughs> together and we would be sitting at a table like this because sometimes that's all it takes. If you're a tech business, that chair. If you're if you're an <laughs> internet-based business, you don't need a big back office. Sometimes you just need a table and reliable internet access. So those shared workspaces, those incubators, they've been a great boon. But that middle school stage of development that we called it, once you get up to 15 employees, 20 employees, 30 employees, you've outgrown that shared workspace sometimes, but you're not quite ready mm -hmm. for, for the big time commercial real estate. You mm -hmm. can't rent out a whole floor. I think that's the area that we need to target. And how do we do that? Well, there's a number of ideas, but one idea is to bring those people together bring together company A and company B. Somebody has 30 employees, somebody has 20. They come together and they share rent on a larger space. It just makes a lot of sense to do that, and that's one of our recommendations in this report. Okay, great. So I've got my business started. Um, I managed to find one of those nice shared office space. I've got that one chair. We mm -hmm. can afford that. The business is off the ground. We're making, a, we're doing okay. And all of a sudden, I come up with what a lot of businesses have identified as the first real time they, they deal with a lot of regulatory problems. I come up with my taxes, my business taxes, my city and my state and federal business taxes. And all of a sudden, I think, gosh, what am I going to do? I have all this stuff due. I wasn't even keeping records. Of what, what should I do? Who do, how do I, who do I turn to in the city to help me with that? What can the city do to help businesses with that first tax filing, that first report, the first papers they have to file as a company? There's an enormous amount to learn as an entrepreneur. I mean, ask any entrepreneur and they will tell you, I mean, to say that the learning curve is steep is an enormous understatement. It's like falling off a cliff in reverse. <laughs> um, and so what you need to do is, 
you know, I, I think what business owners say is um, sometimes it can be daunting, it can be overwhelming. How do I deal with whether it's the first tax filing or the first kind of interaction with the Department of Buildings? I think one of the places to go within government is the Department of Small Business Services. If you're a small business, they have options for you. They have services available for you. They can provide legal advice. They're not going to be your attorney, but they can provide legal advice on certain things. They can explain how the tax code operates and make sure that you're taking advantage of subsidy programs or tax credit programs that you might be eligible for. Um, you know, if you open up a business in Lower Manhattan, there's a program that allows you to get a break on energy costs, for instance, and it's not at all clear that you would know that. Right. If you just started your business, right. um, it, there's there's no public service announcements about these types of things. Right. But there are a whole host of of services out there, and so the Department of Small Business Services (SBS) can help you navigate that process and make sure that while well, you've got to pay the piper like we all do, that you're taking advantage of the benefits that are available to you. Right. We want the owner of a small business, the person who started up, to be focused on on their business. To they might not know what the details of the regulatory map. We don't, you know, I mean, we, we want them to focus if we, if we can and to get through that as, as quickly as possible. So that's great to hear. So it would be SBS, the Department of Small Business Services, and we could go, th and as a business owner, could go there and could help navigate through that very tough initial period. Okay, great. So I file my initial reports. Things are going very well. The company is doing really great. We're doing really wonderful. And now we're in that middle school stage of business. We're ready to we're ready to sort of start things off, and we're ready to move in with another company. And we we come up with some new regulatory challenges, some new challenges from the government side that we didn't have before. Here's one that's going to be that folks have been talking a lot about recently: healthcare. When my startups first starting out, you know, I'm just thinking about my product. But now we've got a growing a growing workforce, which is great because mm -hmm. we have lots of people with great jobs, and I want to provide healthcare for my workers and the Affordable Care Act, which has passed recently, is making that, making it trigger. What, what do I do? How, does, how is the Affordable Care Act going to affect me as a small business owner and how should I get health care to my workers, which is very important to them? Well, it's certainly going to affect you as a small business owner, but I just want to say that there's been a lot of chatter about the Affordable Care Act and you've heard from people largely on the right that the Affordable Care Act is going to tie things up for small business. I'm here, I'm here to tell you that the Affordable Care Act is going to make things easier for small business. It is going to streamline the process of small business owners getting affordable insurance for their employees. It's a positive and it's something that we should be looking forward to. Now, President Obama recently delayed the provision of the Affordable Care Act that would have required businesses with over 50 employees to get health care for all of their workers. That will now go into effect in 2015 rather than 2014. But that should not dissuade the vast majority of small businesses who already provide health care for right. their workers, right. regardless of any requirement, right. have to. of taking advantage of the Affordable Care Act and what it offers. So Tuesday, October 1st, it's coming up. This is a big day, not only for New York, but for the entire country. We're going to see the opening of the state's health insurance marketplace. And individuals who need care, businesses who want to provide care to their employees, they should go to that marketplace on October 1st or maybe October 2nd. <laughs> there might be a glitch or two on October 1st, <laughs> you never know. But next week it opens, all right? And you need to go there, explore your options. There will be resources available if you have questions about what the various plans being offered entail for you and your employees. And you're going to s find that there are tax credits available for small businesses to provide insurance to their employees. Tax credits that over 200,000 small businesses in New York State have already taken advantage of since the Affordable Care Act was passed. So the Affordable Care Act should be seen as an opportunity. It's an opportunity not only to do well by your employees, but also to offer an amenity, health care, that is incredibly important to get talent. You want to get the best talent, Absolutely. you're not gonna you're not gonna offer, you know, boilerplate insurance. You're gonna offer quality health care and that's what the Affordable Care Act will provide. Absolutely. We talk about the high tech sector and we talk about that. That's one of the big things. In order to attract 
in order to attract talent in what's a very competitive marketplace. It's not just that you want to offer health care insurance because you want to do right by your employees. I mean, you really have to, right? I mean, you have to in order to be competitive in some, in some cases. So that's good to hear. Um, we often think when we see new legislation passed, like, oh, the new legislation, this will just make it more tricky. But that's not always the case, right? Sometimes legislation can improve the business process or improve efficiency. Can you th what would be an example of, of legislation that might have passed recently that has actually made it easier or streamlined the process beyond the Affordable Care Act? Yeah, so l let's, let's take it from the national level on the Affordable Care Act all the way down to the local level right here in New York City. So we have had a minority and women business enterprise program for years now, but there was a local law passed, Local Law 1, this year, the first law passed in 2013, that updated and modified the Minority and Women Business Enterprise Program and made it a whole lot stronger and much easier to navigate for the entrepreneurs that can take advantage of that opportunity. In short, Corey, what it did was update the percentage targets for city procurement to black-owned firms, Asian-owned firms, women-owned firms, Hispanic-owned firms. But what it also did, and this is very important, was it lifted the cap that was on those contracts. Previously, the targets, the target percentages for city procurement only applied to contracts of under $1 million. Now, those targets to getting business in the hands of minority and women-owned mm -hmm. business enterprises apply to all contracts in the city of New York. And that's a big deal. Absolutely. I mean, we have 8 million people, we've got a $70 billion budget, and we spend over $10 billion a year procuring goods and services. And in the last fiscal year, in fiscal year 2012, the last year we have full data for, only 5% of that $10 billion ultimately ended up for women, minority and women-owned businesses. 5%. And we're living in a majority minority city with over 400,000 minority owned businesses, as we discussed before. So that's just not good enough. Right. And so we can do better than that. And right. local law one is going to help us do better. Right. That's great news. That's great news. OK, so my company has gotten, gotten started up. And I'm glad you, you, you introduced this now. Because so my company's gotten started up. We've got new office space. It's going well. We got through the initial regulatory. Uh, stuff. I was pleasantly surprised. The Affordable Care Act made it easier. Now all my employees have health insurance. Everything's going great. And now, you know, let's say that uh, my company designs apps or something like that. And now I've decided that, you know, who would be a great customer for this? Oh, uh, the city of New York. The city of New York would be one of those great customers that, you know, they have a big market. And I really think my product could help the city. So now I want to bid and I want to be involved with the city procurement process. Where do I go first? That's a great question. This is a place where we really need to improve. It is difficult to navigate the bidding process yeah. for, for on city procurement projects. It's hard to know when bids become available. Sometimes it costs hundreds of dollars just to bid mm. on a particular project. So we need to do better. And one place where you can start again is SBS, the Department of Small Business Services. But there's also procurement officers at every city agency. So if you were a tech business and you thought, I've got this great app that could help any of our agencies, you might reach out to that procurement officer, whether it's the procurement officer at the New York City Police Department, if you felt like your app could help there, or the fire department, the Department of Education, the Department of Information and Technology, any of these places. You reach out to their procurement officer and you introduce yourself. You say, this is my product. You may or may not need it right now, but I want you to know that I am interested in bidding on the city's business. And that's always a good first step, whether it's in business or anything else for that matter. And so that's your first step. You'll get notified by signing up with the city as a potential bidder of give certain opportunities that come along, and then you can stake your claim. The bidding process a few businesses that have come to the Small Business Committee have said can be very confusing um, and can, can seem opaque. And this can be a problem because even if the process isn't actually, if it's, even if it's wonderfully transparent, if it seems opaque to the businesses that are bidding, then that can be tricky. What can we do in order to try to make that process more transparent and more open for yeah, businesses? It, it, it's a good question and it's a tough thing to answer because when a company bids on a project, they often include in the bid various confidential company right. information. 
Right. It can't all be completely public. At the same time, it's a real concern that businesses say, this is too complicated, or I don't even understand the process by which right. I go about doing this. Um, frequently, there are pre-bid meetings, for instance, on bids. And you can't take part in a pre-bid meeting online. They don't have pre-bid meetings in every borough. Sometimes you have to go to Flushing Meadows Corona Park just to pick up the bid packet if you're bidding on something for the Parks Department. I mean, these are, these are inefficiencies in the way our system operates now that can be fixed. There are ways to take advantage of technology so that you can go online and take part in the pre-bid meeting. There are services available that can advise you on how to get involved in this. There are companies that have gone through it before who can be mentors to you. Be and so there are a whole host of ways to kind of tackle this problem. I think we just got to get to work doing them. So my company is doing well. We've expanded a little bit and I've placed this bid and now we just need to find out will I get the bid? Will my company go the whole way and get uh, and get uh, get the next thing forward or or, or how's, how's what's going to happen? And so I'm waiting patiently for that bid. Will my company get it? We don't know, but we will find out in part two of this program where I'll come back with my guest, Andrew. We'll ask about bigger businesses and as businesses grow, the sort of challenges they might face. We'll also take a look at the direction of the city and the direction of small businesses throughout the borough of Manhattan and in the Upper East Side area. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you on the next Community Board 8 Speaks. Have a wonderful night. Thank you.